Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. Today we unpack the wonders of agroforestry. What are the opportunities, the challenges, the myths, and why is it having its breakthrough moment now? Which is not a moment too late, as we need to plant billions of trees as soon as possible. Plus, how to systematize agroforestry design and complexify growing systems. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. In March last year, we launched our membership community to make it easy for fans to support our work. And so many of you have joined as a member. We've launched different types of benefits, exclusive content, Q&A webinars with former guests, Ask Me Anything sessions, plus so much more to come in the future. For more information on the different tiers, benefits, and how to become a member, check gumroad.com slash investingregionag or find the link below. Thank you. Welcome to another episode. Today with Preta Terra, an innovative way of thinking complex and regenerative ancestral production systems for a changing planet. They develop replicable designs of regenerative agroforestry systems, combining scientific data, empirical information and traditional knowledge with technological innovations, building a new and productive paradigm that is sustainable, resilient and long lasting. Welcome, Paula and Walter. Hello, Cohen. Thank you so much for the invitation. We are so glad to be here with you. And thank Uh, you for the introduction. Yeah, thank you, Cohen. I think you said everything about Preta (laughs) Terra. I just took it from your website. So actually, you said it. (laughs) To start with a personal question. A bit of background on both of you. What brought you to regenerative agriculture, agroforestry? Why are you working on soil? Okay, so first of all, I am a biologist and a forest engineer. And I started my work working with forest regeneration, forest restoration, and forest management as a biologist. And then afterwards, I studied forest engineer so that I could understand how human beings could manage the forest for their livelihoods. So the idea was that I understood that as human beings, we couldn't just plant forest to preserve it, but we should plant forest to produce, to make our living from it. And from that point on, I started working with agroforestry systems or complex production system that looks like the forest. So first I understood how the forest worked and then I started to plan productive systems that were inspired in the forest. And that's how I started to work with soil, start working with regeneration and with agroforestry. Yeah, for me, it was pretty much the same, but I'm a forest engineer, also a master in agroforestry, uh, MSc. I have an MSc in agroforestry. And I, I looked for this specific master to understand more about agroforestry. Since my first year of studies in the university as an engineer, I looked and studied a lot about agroforestry, especially here in Brazil, where we are now. There were things happening, not that much that are now, but there are a lot to do to learn. And I learned as much as I could. I went for this master. I learned even more. So then I started to work in Africa, where I did my thesis and everything, and with communities. So I'm passionate about people and how things work and why they work and why they don't. So my real field of work is local knowledge. So understand why people do what they do and what they understand for the very nature that you don't know how to systematize yet, but we can. So I started to study this as much as I could also. And agroforestry was always there, like it permeated all the fields of study I did. So I believe that everything you're going to do has to be with a scientific view, but with a human livelihood, local knowledge overview of all this. So that's my passion on agroforestry. 
And was it easy to find a master on that? I mean, you said I specifically searched for it, which sort of suggests it wasn't that easy. And, sec- and the second part of the question, was that livelihood focus and local community knowledge focus, was that part of the master or did you bring that into your thesis? Well, it wasn't easy or it was actually because there is only one in the world. You can study agroforestry, of course. Uh, you can do a master or a PhD on agroforestry, studying like uh, interactions between species or design or spacement or stratification or anything that goes uh, with agroforestry. But to do a specific master on agroforestry, there is only one in the world that is in Bangor, in the UK, in Wales. It's a very good and old school, and they, they are really good. Even though that's in Europe, in North Europe, in Great Britain, you can still learn a lot because the professors, they came from ECRAF and other organizations, so it's really important master. And so it was easy to find since it was only one, and I brought quite a lot of local knowledge into my thesis because you could go for any field, but I worked with ECRAF. Afterwards, so I developed my thesis in Zambia, working with uh, four different, three different tribes, actually communities there, and the whole approach was about how to take right decisions based on local knowledge. So uh, yeah, I brought it in, and I have been working in Amazon before and after, so I tried to merge how human beings thinking all over the world, despite of uh, where they come from or what background they have. And- how did Preta Terra come about? Because going from what you studied, obviously starting a company is in some cases a huge step, in other cases a very small step. In Europe, both cases, what triggered the start of that company? Well, actually, it was a big step for us. We both have a long story working as independent consultants, but we met actually working in Fazenda da Toca, which is one of the biggest organic farms in Brazil, where we had the opportunity to develop a way to systematize the agroforestry logics into a large-scale framework. So there in in, in Fazenda da Toca, we understood that we had this huge demand of other farmers, other people who were looking for this kind of knowledge, because so far people were only discussing agroforestry for uh, smallholder farmers, not in a large scale. And only in Fazenda da Toca that we really started discussing this logic of large scale. And we had all the time people asking us if we could uh, help them to plan a system, to implement in their own land. They were looking for this. And then we said, well, we should start an initiative that we could spread this to more people, not only in one farm, but to more people. Can you describe that farm a bit? You just say a large scale, just for people that have never heard about it, or have never seen it. How many hectares, what kind of or acres, what kind of trees are we talking about? It's a large, large farm, actually. It's Yeah, 2,300 two hectares. Hectares. It's a very large farm. It's not everything in agroforestry, of course. So we had... I would say we implemented close to 100 hectares of agroforestry focused on citrus, on lemon, for uh, exportation. And so we planted along with the lemon, we had bananas, we had African mahogany, we had eucalyptus, we had uh, native species for biodiversity and for biomass production, and also the grass management in between the rows of trees. So the focus, the focus of Fazenda da Toca is not only agroforestry, is organic production, of especially eggs, for egg, organic eggs production. And so they also work with grains, organic grains, for the chicken, for feeding the chicken. Yeah, I just want to add uh, one thing. It's um, over 5,000 acres, the Fazenda da Toca, and mm-hmm. we were by this time the chiefs of the RD section, so the... Um, research and development section of us in the talker. So we came in to develop with the designs, the proper designs that were economically viable enough mm-hmm. like to, to, to scale. accomplish the ROI and uh, all the estimations, the economical estimations that could be. So you work with your, the whole management process in, of the creation of this those first systems. Mm-hmm. And that's what we scaled in Fazenda da Toca and now they are with a 
another initiative, another company called Rizoma, where they are scaling up even more in other regions of Brazil. That's a spin-off from Fazenda da Toca, mm -hmm. and uh, we were there when they first started also. So. Yeah, they have an amazing work. And then you were approached by others, and you thought, okay, let's set up a company to do this multiple times in different continents as well, because you've worked in Indonesia, a lot in Africa, in Brazil. So what was that phase after leaving that farm and leaving the place where you could experiment this to start doing this on your own and with other farms? Yeah, actually, together we have over almost uh, 30 years of experience in agroforestry. So it was not that big step as we thought, but uh, end up being. We basically were doing consulting while being there and at the same time creating our own ideas, philosophy and beliefs on agroforestry and how to change and how to break paradigms. And then when we first start, we already have potential clients and it starts to grow like exponentially and we start to make it better and better and systematize our own process. So it has been a, a huge wave actually. Yeah. We, we didn't expect that it would be that big, that you could help so many people at the same time and go like beyond the boundaries that we thought you would be in. So, and yeah. it, it grew very fast because in the beginning we were like understanding what our clients or what the people that we were going to work with, they were looking for, what they needed. And so we talked with a lot of people and we understood that what they need is a proper design, a proper planning of the system, design of the complex is, system. Design is the key. So walk us through a typical client or actually an example if you want to share, but we'll choose what you want. And how do you go about of finding that design and thus your approach? Well, we have, um, I think I can describe, you have several kinds of clients. Well, since smallholder farmers, uh, smallhold farmers that we take very much care and we respect a lot because they help us to build not only portfolio but experience and we can help these people that otherwise would be not having this kind of literature or knowledge available easily so we can spread the word but we also have NGOs um, uh, companies and um, big investors and impact investors you want to mm -hmm. describe a little bit uh... so the logics it pretty much is always the same depends uh, it varies on the scale that we are working. So, for instance, one work we did in partnership with WRI in the Amazon. And so they hired us to plan and implement an agroforestry system with smallholder farmers, with local communities that were looking for regenerate their soil because we have this very serious problem in the Amazon that smallholder farmers, even though they are settled now, they use a kind of agriculture, which is lash and burn, that is very ancient, but it's not sustainable anymore if you don't let the soil rest for enough time. And so what we were looking for was a design specific for these farmers and for this context. And so we understood what we do in the first place is like a, a diagnostic. We understand all the context. We do all the local knowledge acquirement assessment. So we understand what is it that they already cultivate, the crops, the species, what are the native species in the forest, the species that they like to manage in the forest, they harvest in the forest, and what are the species that they already grow. Mainly there, they used to plant cassava, that's the most important crop for them. And so necessarily the system had to have, have cassava for them. So we just complexified the cassava production. Yeah, we brought species together. In This is one kind of client, as you ask, but we have other ones like companies that, like Verstegen, for instance, or La Grama in Peru. The work they do are very similar. Uh, they are people that are trying to match or to meet the expectations of their clients that are buying those regenerative products or let's say organic so far. And um, these companies, they buy from outgrowers. So they don't really own land, but they try to improve the livelihoods of these people around the world, especially on the tropics. And uh, basically, they promote regenerative agriculture, uh, organic agriculture, I would say. But now they are trying to have one more step on that, going into regenerative agriculture or agroforestry. So what we do is we go to their place 
as Paulo just explained, we're trying to understand all the background, the expectations, the basic livelihood that people have, and we plan upon that a new agroforestry system that is adherent enough that could work for these people. And what the company starts to deliver is not just a premium price for their products, but also a regenerative system, a model that this forest dependent people can use to improve their land while you produce with enough profit to keep doing the kind of agriculture they do, but now improved. And uh, I just want to compliment that what Preta Terra does, <clears throat> what we do, is the whole process. We analyze, we plan, we implement, we train, we do capacity build, mm-hmm. we monitor, we monitor, we do the whole process. So you literally go to the ground. Besides doing our own farm or and the projects that you are around, we generally go and do at least the first plots and the first implementation we do ourselves, being present, understand the whole process. And uh, it's important that we usually implement on the ground a few modules that can be replicable, that can be scaled up by them. So the farmers understand the system, they understand the logics, and they would implement and grow it and make it in a, in bigger areas or in their own lands. So that's pretty much what we did in La Grama. We planned a system for ginger and turmeric production for the high mountains in the Amazon, in the Peruvian Amazon. And the idea would be it's not only organic. Organic is not enough. They, they, they're supposed to plant a system that is more biodiverse, like the environment where they are, like the landscape where they are and that needs to be more resilient as well. So that's why we diversified their system. We put not only ginger and turmeric, but also fruits, also timber, also nuts, and also service species, also trees that were supposed to be pruned to produce biomass and cover the soil. Yeah, uh, b- before making it into a monologue and yeah. open space to you to make more questions. No, I think it's extremely interesting. You mentioned the complexifying, I, I love the verb, complexifying. I think the move from one cash crop, which could be pepper or ginger or cassava or something going, I mean, it's very much obviously in line with regenerative agriculture, going away from monocultures, which sometimes is difficult to Imagine when you are, are, I don't know, a grain operator in the Midwest and you have to, you start maybe putting together different types of grain and harvesting in different times, obviously cover crops, etc. But when you are in agroforestry, it's sort of more natural, but also there we often think of plantations of one type, maybe coffee or maybe something else. And that complexifying obviously brings a lot of questions with it. And I think that might be one of the reasons why agroforestry hasn't grown as much or is growing now instead of 40 years ago or 30 years ago, because the complexifying we've known and seen, but we haven't seen it, as you said before, at a larger scale. So what is different now that suddenly you see all this activity at agroforestry beyond one acre or one hectare, but actually at 2,300 and large, people are talking about large agroforestry systems over the last, I think, five years, maybe before as well, but what, what has changed in your mind that suddenly agroforestry at larger scales is possible or seems possible. I just want to make you one little statement here. What we do that is different is to make a tailor-made design. So that's what brings replicability. I think I can answer your your question pretty well, what has changed now. Mm -hmm. But basically, you have to keep in mind that this complexity, that how to manage... It's context-specific, yeah. Yeah, it's context specific. Completely. Yeah. Exactly. So you ha- it has to be tailor made. It has to be specific for the area, for the people. But not to be annoying, but 40 years ago, it also had to be tailor made. Like, they're not, I mean, has the knowledge increased enormously? Do we have new technology that we suddenly know? Has we suddenly discovered this? Or what has changed in 2020 or 2015 when suddenly this boom of Ernst Goetz and a lot of other people, suddenly we are talking about scale and not small, small, cute things anymore, which is amazing, which is great. I'm very happy about it, but I'm wondering what changed. You have to merge your knowledge. I would would say that firstly, in the public policies, agroforestry was only focused for smallholder farmers. So this is the first thing that has been changing in the last few years, because larger farmers are starting to take it seriously. I would say that this is the first thing. 
The second thing, many people actually ask us, why is it that agroforestry is not everywhere yet since it's so amazing, it's so no. perfect, it's so... It's uh, the solution it's, for it's all the problems. And actually, the complexity, it's a good thing, but also it's a challenge. The complexity is very difficult to manage. People don't understand, don't know how to manage complexity. And that's the most difficult part of agroforestry. Because if you are a farmer and you have only one product, you have to understand all the agronomic parts of this one crop. You have to focus on the market for this only one crop. And okay, you can do that. But once you grow to two crops, to a crop and a nut, or two crops, a nut and a timber in the end of the system. So you raise up the complexity. So you have to plan very hard. And what we did was to understand the system, this complexity, in a systematized way. So the systematization for us is key, is the most important thing. So we have to plan every step. We have to understand all the crops involved. We have to understand all the management along the cycle. So if we plan a system for 40 years, we would have to know when do we plan to prune a timber tree which are the years that we are going to prune this timber tree. So we have to build capacity for the people who are going to manage to prune timber trees. So we have to, to know when we are going to prune the fruit trees. We have to know how to prune service trees. So it's a lot of complexity. So there is like a step-by-step -step process to systematize the design and to understand how to manage it all along the process. And most important of all is to plan the costs. You have to understand all the costs involved, not only in the implementation, but along the whole cycle. So if you understand, if you know every year which are the management actions that you're going to take, you can predict a little bit. Of course, you will have changes all along the way, but you can predict how much is it going to cost. And if you know how much it's going to cost, you can start uh, modeling it financially. And this is what was missing, actually. We have to plan the agroforestry system in a systematized way and in, in an economical way. We have to see how viable economically it will be. Because in Fazenda da Toca, for instance, we used to plant eucalyptus as a service species, but we have to prune every year this eucalyptus. So how much does it cost to prune this eucalyptus? So we did this study all over again, understanding what is the operation to prune it, how much does it cost, which is how long does it take for the operators to do it. And this data wasn't there. There was no data set on pruning. This data, there is no data. We have to produce this data. Most this, of the data on agroforestry, yeah. there, uh, there isn't yet. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, as, uh, as machinery, we have a lot of machinery for agriculture and for forestry, but not agroforestry and machinery. The same for data, because you have one specific data for in one specific place in the world with this species and that. So when you try to complexify and use like uh, interactions between data, this big data that are of uh, agroforestry, it, it is not there yet. But what you can do is create those kind of designs that are, are, are modular, replicable, and elastic. So you can consider one species in a functional niche or in a functional group. So you can add several species to that same group and doesn't matter if you are implementing in Africa and um, in Europe or in South America, in the tropics, we can go for a specific logic that we can apply succession and stratification. Just talking about the two main principles of agroforestry. Can you explain them a bit for anybody that hasn't dove deep into that yet? Yeah, so, uh, well, uh, succession is the time. Why is stratification are the floors? So basically, every plant will occupy a, a specific floor, a specific layer of the forest, talking on the land like a tri-dimensionally. Tri so you're talking about the vertical occupation of those species. That's stratification. While um, a succession is the timing they occur. So every time of the succession, so if you have one plant that lives one year, 
there are annual plants, uh, it's an annual plant, let's say. So it will stay there for one year. During this time, it will occupy a specific strata. And this strata will be like, it can be high, upper high, a medium or low. So it doesn't matter. The, the plant will have a specific strata that it occupies. It doesn't matter the size it is or how high it is. So for every grass, it has a specific strata that it occupies. Generally, it will it need a lot of sun, so it, it will be upper crown. But for trees, they have like a lot of different kinds of um, possibilities. But those are the two main things you work on agroforestry to occupy this space, tridimensionally. So to sum up, succession would be how long the species or the group of species will stay in the system. So if you have a species that will last for 40 years and takes like five or six years to grow up, uh, while it's growing, you can plant in the same point, in the same time, other species that are short period. So they won't compete with each other because the one that lasts longer is not big yet. So it's the same thing. You can plant maize over here with a Brazil nut right next to it because the Brazil nut is not going to compete with the corn, with the maize. Because Rather, it will be benefited yeah, by the shade. By the shade of it. Which, I mean, I just want to pause a second because for, I wouldn't say centuries, but for a long time, what you just explained was something that we couldn't understand, or at least if we grow corn or we grow one crop, and you sort of thought about it as 2D, like only two dimensions. It, it either grows or doesn't grow. That's more or less it. And you're basically saying, and everybody else who's working in agroforestry, let's look at it 3D because you have all the space up and down and you have time. So actually you almost go in 4D because you add the time component to it, which you have to plan for because it takes six years for this Brazil not to grow up, which means you need six years of other cash flow. If you would only do that, you would have a quite a big problem in your bank account. So it completely changes the discussion to, and makes it much more complex. And to that, actually, my question, this sounds amazing. And that's why probably everybody's saying agroforestry is the system to, the solution to any problem we ever had. But then if you start working with a smallholder farmer, how do you make sure that he or she has the space and time to think about that and to manage when you leave a complex system like that? How do you make sure that any farmer that you've worked with, even if you're there in the beginning and you've worked with the, the pilot plots, et cetera, at some point you need to go to the next client. How do you make sure that that complexity and all that knowledge doesn't get lost? Yeah, we have to yeah. monitor, we have to be close, but you have, have to simplify. To, to, yeah, we have, to, have simplify to simplify and to explain before, right? So all of them, when we implement a system, they have like this gun chart of activities and years at least. So they have to know, okay, I'm in the first year of my system. I have to prune the the fruits fruit trees. I have to prune my service trees. I have to to cut clean down. to cut down the grass in the middle. So we we organize, we systematize the operations in a simple gun chart. That's just it. But you have to simplify it a little bit. Of course, you have the utopic uh, agroforestry, super complex, but you have the ideal agroforestry that is viable economically, that is uh, viable technically for the farmer to manage. So that's why you have to simplify and to systematize the operations along the time. Yeah, and let's say that you have, uh, you can see in a line uh, and you start with bare land or monocrop, let's say. It's pretty much the same, yeah. Yeah, it's not the same exactly. It's, it's a green desert or whatever adjective you you have to give to that. But yeah, you understand the point. And on the other side, you have a forest, a real forest. I mean, it doesn't have to be a tropical forest, but the maximum of this environment that this environment can provide by that time. So you have a complex forest. But in, in, the, in the middle, you can have a sort of uh, kind of production that doesn't have to be the big complex agroforestry, but can have three, four species or occupy the system properly, tridimensionally. And it you have uh, a lot of benefits that you can even imagine. You are just grasping of the benefits that this kind of complex system can, can give to us. And I, I would even pose, as you said, uh, that agroforestry has been there since the, the very beginning of agriculture, if you talk about like 13,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent, like it was there. The, the, the very first agriculture we did, we did on the boundaries of forests or in the, in the clean, uh, clearings of forests. So it was agroforest in some way. We, we just lost that 
and um, in a few years ago, few few, few hundreds of years much. ago, and you just simplified too much to have this maze or nothing or 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 beans or maze. And um, what you are trying to to do now is recover some of this knowledge, but using technology in our favor. And uh, uh, even if you think about photosynthesis. We can, uh, there's a lot of people talking today about like a, improving photosynthesis through uh, more carbon dioxide and the right amount of sun or, uh, or uh, adding uh, fertilizers or uh, organic fertilizers or bio fertilizers. But you can, you can do that just changing the shape of our plantation using stratification. So you can have a wave of you can you can make our surface different instead of have a plain surface on the canopy you can have like a a, a, a waved surface i have to explain that so because obviously Walter is doing a wave on the video but nobody can see that <laughs> um so basically if you imagine a flat plain land somewhere and if you just plant corn or one crop they're all going to be more or less the same height which means they all capture sunlight at more or less the same time. They probably shut off at more or less the same time. They get overcooked, etc. But if you integrate other species that have different heights, you basically create a wave on the landscape, which is different for wind, which is very different for sun. And basically, as any farmer is a solar entrepreneur that tries to get as many sunlights as they could possibly get and turn them into sugars or something useful, you want to have as many solar panels out there, which means as many leaves, as many surfaces that can do photosynthesis. So as soon as you go into a wave, you basically intensify your possibility of capturing sunlight and doing photosynthesis instead of having this flat surface where for kilometers and kilometers and kilometers, you don't see anything else than a line. You try to create different areas to capture sunlight. Yeah, exactly. uh, Cisco explained it way better than me. Uh, you don't have to say anything else. Uh, that's just perfect. Would, that's my job, asking questions. <laughs> I would just add that you can go for 1.6, like 60% more wow. surface area for photosynthesis. So that's the way you could harvest it 60% more. So it's a lot of improvement. Which is a nice bridge to my next question. I think you might get a lot of attention as well, but I definitely get a lot of people that are very excited about this as well. And investors that want to invest, they are convinced about agroforestry, they've read some books, they've maybe visited some farms, hopefully, they've seen some videos. What would be some tips from your side as you have seen so many agroforestry systems that worked and so many that didn't? What would be one or two key questions that investors should ask or things they should look out for when they are getting active in the agroforestry world, which is super exciting, but obviously full of noise and full of things that we don't know yet are not going to work? Okay, so I would say that the investor should look for the planning, understand what does, does that agroforestry is looking for to be. I mean, uh, why the person planted that agroforestry and what is, is it supposed to produce, you know? So are you planning to harvest first, first um, uh, short-term crop? Or are you going to plant to harvest uh, coffee? How is your planning? How does it look like? And so you will understand uh, when is is it going to pay itself at least, or when is it the, yeah, no. the break even point? So you can understand a little bit when are the the revenues, the incomes inside the system. Go for the management. Mm -hmm. Go for the management for all the investors. Go for the management. Try to see, okay, are you going to do this kind of complexity? Are you going to plant like in this way? Okay, okay, I understand all the benefits of agroforestry for environmental services, mm -hmm. carbon in the soil, blah, blah, blah. But now tell me, how are you going to manage that? Mm -hmm. What you are expecting? What is the machinery? Uh, what is the people that is going working? How many will be working on that? Mm -hmm. This is going to work. You have seen that before. If not, of course, uh, no, no problem. It uh, hasn't. We we haven't seen so much um, large scale agroforestry in the world. But let's say is that is that well planned? How you're going to manage? Mm -hmm. think the because design is okay. It's not that complex, actually. Uh, the problem is that, for instance, in Brazil, we have many opportunities uh, for public financing for financing the the agroforestry systems, either for smallholder farmers, but for big farms as well. But the banks won't give the financing if there's no uh, not a proper planning. You have to, to know what, when are you going to harvest? How much do you plan to harvest? So you have to have this planning. So it's the same logics as to, to 
to for finance, something like that. And I would say that it's not that complex because we planned uh, a project, uh, coffee design. We planned and implemented uh, a coffee designed for Minas Gerais, uh, for a region where they produce this very special coffee. A super high quality coffee and they were looking for not only organic but a complex and agroforestry system but not that complex that they wouldn't be able to manage so we planned wasn't a super complex design actually we had all together with the coffee we had the macadamia nut yeah macadamia nut the nut. cedar so we had coffee a nut and a timber tree and a few species for service species that we call it to, to bring uh, diversity and to, to nitrogen, bring nitrogen biomass. and biomass for the system. So we just uh, diversify the production. We have coffee and macadamia nut. And when we did the economical modeling, we understood that the macadamia could provide the same amount of, of revenue as the coffee did. Yeah, that's a good question. Actually. How, what do you see in terms of I mean, obviously the ecosystem returns and obviously the non-financial returns, but can you explain that a bit more, like the financial returns for potential investors or companies? What do you see there? Like, do you see these huge changes? Because that's the same as coffee, which is, which was, and is the cash crop. It's, that's enormous. That changes everything for the farmer. If the costs of the implementing and the maintenance, et cetera, obviously aren't as high as well. So what changed there? If you had to look at that example in terms of broad changes in terms of costs and revenues. Yeah, again, we are talking about diversification. So mm -hmm. if you diversify, the main thing you have to see your, uh, you have to see your soil, your, your land as your biggest asset, especially if you're talking about on a climate change world or global warming scenario. So you have to think that you have to save our main asset, that's our soil. And in that way, the system is key. Again, the design, we have this a microclimate creation besides all the nitrogen and, and biomass and everything and carbon in the soil. So if you look into that, you have, you're going to diversify your species. Since you diversified species, crops in the, in, the, in the area, you consequently diversify your income and you're going to be more resilient for the market. So once you see that, another key factor for the investors to ask is how is it planned when you give a ROI, a VPN, a MPV, uh, how did the guys came to those numbers? Mm -hmm. What we do generally is do that uh, modularly per species. So every time you have to change a species in our models, the, the whole model will change, but you understand perfectly how much this species, not perfectly, of course, but you can have a prognosis of how much one tree will produce mm -hmm. and how much this tree is going to produce if it's under shade, mm -hmm. how much it produces if it's planted with the other species. So you can infer uh, by experience, by literature, um, by, by uh, uh, no, uh, local knowledge, you can infer partially uh, how it's going to change. And from this, this very basic table of uh, knowledge and, and, and numbers, you can do different uh, modelings. You can do different economical modelings and end up in seeing our coast as, um, um, as, a, as the, main, uh, uh, the main tool of decision-making that you can have. So you can go and, and say, okay, so this tree is giving me a, a good revenue, but it's costing a lot to manage. Instead, of this other one is not costing that much, and the revenue is similar. So we can adapt our system to a proper uh, and profitable system. Yeah, I would say that you just have to compare it with the mono monoculture. So, yeah. for instance, this one of the example of coffee. If we, we compare it, with a monoculture crop uh, plantation of coffee. We have 5,000 th 5, plants of coffee in the monocrop, mono and we have 3,000 um, in the other design, in the agroforestry design. We have 3,000 coffee plants plus uh, 500 macadamia nut. Of course, that in the same area, we will produce a little bit uh, less coffee, of course, because there are less coffee plants. But we will have a second product of this 
of this design. So we just have to know in how many, in, in one hectare or in one module, how many plants of each species of or of each crop are there and how much your prognosis says that it's going to produce. Of course, we used the information of the monocrop information. So we know that this variety of coffee produces uh, five kilos of coffee per year. Uh, but since it's a little bit under shade and now we'll say we'll be conservative and say it produces four kilos uh, per year. And the same thing as the for plant, per plant. And the same thing about the macadamia. It produces, for instance, 20 kilos of, of nuts per year. And so if we know for one plant, we know for the whole uh, system. And you can course. change, you can adapt. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing that Paula said that is extremely important is that, that, uh, that people used to say or get confused uh, thinking that agroforestry produces more. It doesn't. Agroforestry will not produce more. It will produce more per area, but not per plant. So if you have a cacao production and says that in agroforestry you're going to produce more, that's a lie. That's not true. It is, definitely, true. that's not true. But definitely, you can have more calories yeah. going mm -hmm. there exactly. together at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have much more production and resilience. Mm -hmm. So what you look for and what you aim uh, with agroforestry is, is optimization rather than maximization mm -hmm. maximize maximizing a system is not is not right we did that with green revolution didn't didn't go as well didn't went well and uh, we didn't solve the problems we believed we would but if you we optimize our system it will be resilient and you have more uh, yields per area but not per species Mm -hmm. So you have to consider those. This trade-off is extremely important. Yeah. And you need to find the customers for the different species, obviously, because there are only so many macadamia nuts you can eat yourself. So it needs to be a certain level of scale, which fits in the context that there are in your area buyers for a right price for the extra crop. And I think often there it's that's lacking. Like you need almost to buy your full rotation if you were an annual crop farmer. But if you're a perennial farmer, you need to find different people or someone that buys all your sellable produce, not your service trees, but the other ones. And then you need a bit of scales in some cases, obviously, to do that. I was going to ask you, how do you monitor your projects when you're not there or when you're, how do you make sure to keep track? I think, which is a question for investors as well. What do you monitor in terms of data, both on the ground, in the ground, in the trees? What are your key monitor aspects you look at? Well, there are different tools and different approaches and every project is different. So you don't have one answer to that. But you're a first engineer, so you work a lot with statistics and and um, so you do experiments all the time. Uh, what we have done, I think that comes handy to, uh, to use as an example what we did in the Amazon. We create an index um, called the API, Agroforestry uh, Performance Index, that you use um, very visual features to classify how the system is going. So instead of measure uh, complicated things, so imagine a, a, a first independent person living in the Amazon, being a smallholder farmer, and uh, without um, even access to a city or to a lab. So you cannot like test like leaves or content or or even a, a simple soil analysis. So what we do is uh, is rather than this, we we count. Uh, the number of species, the amount of biomass in the soil by by size by by uh, uh, how how thick it, it is, or um, biodiversity, what kind of birds we are seeing that land, or uh, yield uh, in a very simple way. So comparing this using uh, metrics of uh, comparing this to to literature. The things that have been proved, so you know pretty much that if, that if a soil has that much of covering, uh, uh, it's pretty much like the carbon content will be between this and that. So doing correlation and using new technology, let's say new technology is WhatsApp. So <laughs> trying to have these people engaged, which is great because you can take pictures. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly, yeah, super, yeah, exactly. The things are there already. You yeah. have all the technology you need. You just have to be smart, smart, fast doing quickly and have these people engaged. Yeah. So they, they can show what they are doing and, and you can see remotely a lot. Mm -hmm. And even now and then, or when the project can pay for that, when we are close enough, we are, things change, we can we can have labs. So you can collect okay. uh, 
soil, and soil leaves, leaves and, and do the the normal and and, and follow the procedure for but, chemical but analysis. Pretty much, what we need to understand in monitoring is just the productivity, like how much the trees are growing, how much they are producing, and the costs involved. So, how long are you taking to manage your yeah. your your production system? Uh, what are the inputs that you are putting in it? And it's pretty much it. So, there are a few uh, indicators that will tell us about the environmental quality, which is what Walter said, the biodiversity, the number of species, pretty much it, and the soil covering. And that's very a, a very simple and easy way to, to monitor, and you can do it in a remote way via WhatsApp yeah. with the farmers. Super interesting. I want to ask you an experimental question that I haven't asked a lot on the podcast. If you look in agroforestry, you've already mentioned a few things that were missing or are missing, but to really make this scale and grow and be replicable. I mean, you're working on a lot, but if you had to focus on only one thing, and I'm using the ITN framework for that, which is importance, tractability, and neglectedness. So is there something in agroforestry that's very important? Like it would be absolutely crucial if that could be fixed, it would be amazing for the world. It's very solvable. Like we know how to do it. We don't have to invent anything new. It's not nuclear fusion or anything. And it's neglected. Like there are very few people working on it. What would be the thing in agroforestry that would be super important? super solvable and doable and also traceable and monitorable and what is the thing that most people are not working on design i would say the design. design the system come back to the design, yeah. design. Yeah, you yes. come back that's key that's key. yeah because the fact is we have all this huge amount of knowledge uh spread around the world about monocrops about each crop uh, about each species yeah. and it's everywhere you know so if you plant the shelves yeah, so you, you don't have access to it. So what we need is to put all this knowledge together yeah, this. and to use this, apply it to a systematized production system. This is something that we've been working uh, a long time now, and it's probably going to take even longer to finish because it's very complex. It's like it's something like a, like a tool, like a software, where we can build this huge database about species. So we have a huge list of species and crops and all the parameters about them. What are, are their succession? What are their strata? How do you manage them? Uh, which region are they, are, are they going to produce? How much do they produce? Which time of the year do they produce? All the information about them. Carbon, all the carbon information mm -hmm. together, the, all the yields, the, the trade-offs, like it used to. The crown architecture, all the information about those species and crops. And with this in hand, you'll be able to plan a much proper and and viable design, you know? Yeah. But you have to and have adherent, this knowledge. And enough yeah. adherent and uh, with uh, and empowerment. How does indigenous knowledge fit into that? Like traditional knowledge, which you mentioned some of it is lost, some of it is there, some of it we probably half remember, but don't really like what's the, because there's so much knowledge uncovered as well in other languages, not even written. Like, how do you get that into a system? Systematize, you systematize. So local knowledge is a whole process. That's a yeah. very important it, key it of comes, the process. Uh, it's an anthropological approach, definitely. And you translate that into math or into, into numbers. Um, uh, ECRAF has a tool called the AKT. AKT is a pretty good tool. Uh, quite old now, but you can start from that. But basically, you talk to people, you understand, and you take things that make sense. You leave things that doesn't make that much sense aside for a while, and you just systematize it. You just say, okay, so it makes sense with that. So mm -hmm. it goes in a column, and you start to to make sense all of out of this all. And how often are you wrong? <laughs> in the sense that you put it in a column, and actually it should have been in another one. Or the thing that wasn't important, you thought, actually turned out to be quite important. Oh, okay, because actually we are very conservative, I would say. Because, yeah, for instance, when we put a production uh, yield for a species, for instance, we always put it in the database uh, per plant, of course. So we always put a little bit less, you know, it's very important. Everything should be conservative. And uh, probably you will be wrong in the end because you planned less and yeah. probably you will be... Under promise and over deliver, yeah. Yeah, maybe over deliver, but, but it would be the problem. But uh, I sorry. think you have to be conservative. But everything will be there with your yeah. weight. So you change weights. 
So let's say that one specific tree will flower and will bloom in Brazil. And uh, just after 40 days after the blooming, you plant the maize mm -hmm. as a, a typical example. So it will be there with other scientific improved information. And it will have like a weight of uh, 0 0.2, let's say. And you're going to wait until that makes more sense to the scientific one, and you're going to adjust the weights. Yeah, but so it's everything not like handy. you'll be wrong all the time or you'll be right all the time. You just have to have like a framework. You know the way you, you go. You know the path, but you have to build it along the way, of course, because you're talking about agriculture. You're talking about management, a biological system. So it's much co more complex than just planning it. And it will vary a lot according to how much it will rain, all the weather of each year. And if you have any problem with some pests or, or some diseases, you will have to adapt, of course. But you have like um, like a framework. You know where to start, where you're aiming, where to finish, you know. So it's not that much complicated. What our dream, I would say, like our dream and our also our goal is to build this tool and to make it available for people. Somehow that uh, it will become like a platform where you plan your design based on this big database and you will monitor your system, like the productivity, the growth of the trees, the timber, everything. And then you will feed this, the database as well. So if we have, we have a productivity for one species, one specific tree in Sao Paulo state in Brazil, and the same tree uh, will produce a, a little bit different in Sumatra, uh, island in Indonesia. So in that design, they will uh, feed the the database like a huge platform. That would be like like a dream. Like, but maybe yeah, maybe that would it solve happen. it. That We're would working solve. on that. Yeah. We're working on that. Which answers one of my questions. If you had a magic wand, what would you change overnight? If you could do anything, I think I can answer the question for you. You would make sure that system would be there tomorrow, tonight, basically. Yeah, I, I would add one thing with this magic, Wendy. I, I, I would like to make it disappear all the fakers in the world. Let's say all the people that are saying that doing something it is not doing and is actually jeopardizing the real work on agroforestry and like making the, is blowing the, the process of adoption. Because you do believe that agroforestry can solve pretty much all the problems in mm -hmm. the world. So you just need serious people. And it's a nice bridge, actually. We've talked about the financial side and investors. If you would be in charge of a $1 billion investment fund tomorrow morning, not with a magic wand, like you had to do the work, you cannot just outsource it. <laughs> How would you invest that? And I'm asking this question because I think there's going to be a lot of influx of capital and we as a sector need to be ready. So I understand it's a lot of money and you don't have to go to the dollar. Like I want to put 200 million there, et cetera. But what would be the main pieces you would invest in to really, let's say, move agroforestry forward, but also obviously with an investor hat on? Well, well, actually, it's a lot of money. And with this huge amount of money, maybe we could take like 5% of it to develop the software, but all the rest should go on the ground. To the go ground. To plant trees, should go to the, the forest dependent people, should go to finance, uh, collecting seeds, uh, building nurseries, um, buying uh, tractors and everything to, to cut move. all the administration fees mm -hmm. that the, the people ground. are using. Cut mm -hmm. all them. Cut them all and go straight to the ground and yeah. make agroforestry. Because and just five percent for the software because yeah, you do believe that you can it's do enough. it. Too. You know, it's not that much complicated. But to put agroforestry in the ground with one billion, how much you said? One billion. One billion. N nine zeros. Yeah. No, I would say you can do a lot with that. A lot. How much? How yeah, many yeah, hectares yeah. you would say we can do with I'm that? Just thinking about the Great Green Wall, but that's a uh, subject for our next <laughs> podcast. No, but... you can plant... For another episode. Yeah. yeah. yeah but it's a good, I mean, 5% on the software to monitor, to make it accessible for anybody that's not touched by the other 95 that you invest in the land and in the trees and in the soil. I think it's a very good answer. And a question I asked, and I actually interviewed him yesterday, John Kemp, he always asked in his podcast about conventional and extractive agriculture, what do you believe to be true that others don't? And I like to ask it in terms of regenerative agriculture, we can ask it in agroforestry as well. Like, what do you do 
believe to be true that others don't believe to be true in agroforestry or regenerative agriculture, whatever you prefer. Trees. We have to have trees. In the system. Um, I think like many people believe that you can add this, um, like biofertilizers and make the plant healthy and so the soil will be healthy enough. Otherwise, you can just rebuild your soil to make plants healthy. There's one thing, one machine called the tree that can do all the job. And trees are, we have to believe, you have to understand that trees are social beings. They were here way before we, we, we mammals, so it's not even human beings, but mammals were here. So plants uh, have been here on Earth for a long while and, um, and they don't move. So, well, they move a little bit, but they, uh, since they are stuck the, to the place they were born or they, the, they grow, they germinate, they have to, uh, to cope with all the solutions being there. So they are extremely adapted. And so they have to cooperate between each other. So when you have a complex system, so what we believe is that you cannot do regenerative agriculture if you don't add trees to the system. You have to have trees and you have to have biodiversity yeah. because each species has its own uh, role in the system. So each tree or each crop will cycle a different nutrient will uh, relate to a different microorganism in the soil. So we'll be able to capture the sun in a different moment of the day. So you have to have this diversity. And the trees, they are the most important um, component of the landscape, actually, because they are the ones who bring all the ecosystem services that we are looking for. They fix the carbon. They uh, regulate the microclimate. They protect the soil. They bring the rain. Exactly. They suck the water to the soil. They cycle the nutrients very, very deep in the soil and bring it to the surface. So it's for free. You know, you just put them on the ground. Just put the trees on the ground. And yeah. that's pretty much what we are looking for. Trees. Putting trees in the ground. And uh, you have to be humble because uh, when you talk about nitrogen or carbon, carbon fixation or... Um, Photosynthesis. Even though that's the main thing, plants do photosynthesis. They interchange uh, solar, uh, as you said, like they harvest the sun and use carbon dioxide. But it is still a short sight way of seeing because we don't know. We have to be humble. We just have to let nature do its job. So it's more complex than we believe you have actually understood so far. So put trees in the system, they will work a lot. And to End with a final question. I always say that, but it's usually not true. But to end with a final question, I know you're working on a, and actually Philippe, who I interviewed before of Renature, was already mentioning it a bit on a big degraded land project in Brazil with cattle and silver pasture. Can you explain a bit that? So to make it concrete, as we're ending this podcast, what that project is about, what you're doing there, it's large scale. Fernando who introduced us, also mentioned it. What are you doing on the ground there? And obviously there are trees involved. <laughs> yeah, there will be. So this project is supposed to be a model for the whole region because in southern, in western Brazil, uh, the most important activity is uh, cattle ranching, and they are free actually. They are yeah. they are extensive uh, production, but if it's not made properly, uh, eventually you will degrade your pasture. Of course, and it's related to deforestation, not because, not only because it's occupying the land where it used to be a forest, but also because there is no trees in the pasture land. Yeah. So you have this huge area of pasture land without trees. So the the idea, the focus on this project is to develop a production system that could merge uh, the the cattle ranching, the cattle production, with trees. In the landscape, yeah, it's and all... diversifying the the yield, not only the money coming from the cattle, but also from the trees. Yeah, respecting the uh, the the, produ the animal production, uh, I mean the animal welfare, uh, while rebuilding the system. Mm -hmm. So uh, adding trees is an audacious project. We have the we want to create the best cattle ranching agroforestry system in the world. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're talking about. Amazing. It's an amazing and audacious project. How big is it? 
what are we talking about? And it's just to paint the picture. From what I understand, it's very degraded land. So what are you planning to introduce just to make it visual for the podcast listeners? Like, what should we imagine that it's now and what should it be in five or 10 years? Well, we still don't know uh, a species or the design it properly. We are at the very beginning of the project. So mm -hmm. you are surveying now. That's actually our part is to plan the design and to implement it on the ground. So we are talking about one farm with 1,200 hectares, and this is the is going the to be the model farm. Potentially, it can grow to 23,000 hectares, but the idea is that other farmers in the region will get inspired from it, will understand yeah, it, and try to do it by themselves as well. And it's going to involve obviously different tree species and different management of the cattle, I can imagine, to not have it overgrazed like they're doing now. Yes. No, absolutely. It it's will, going to yeah. be a lot of work. We are very excited about it, but definitely we'll add a lot of timber trees. We'll add some nut species to produce nuts and we'll have to plan the grazing very well. It's going to be a big challenge. But. Yeah, and it's uh, it's uh, extremely multidisciplinary. So mm -hmm. there will be uh, we will be working with several schools of possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, it's audacious. It's a big project. We'll see yeah. in the next month. I'm looking forward to checking in in another podcast to see how the design, but especially the implementation, obviously, is coming along. I want to thank you so much, Paul and Walter, for your time today and your enthusiasm and sharing the progress in agroforestry, the challenges, the opportunities, what's missing, what's going well, and basically getting us up to speed. Great. Thank we appreciate so much, the opportunity as well. For us, it's a pleasure to share our vision, our work, and we really believe in agroforestry. We are so sure that if we plant trees and we systematize and we plan the system, uh, we can improve so much all the landscapes, all the production systems. And that's our mission. That's what we are working for. Yeah. Thank you, Coin. It was a pleasure. No, no. Plenty of trees. Add the trees to your land. And don't believe in only one answer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> believe in the trees. I saw a great quote of, I think it's the um, savory hop person in the Nordics, so in Norway, or in one of the Nordic countries, that said underperforming landscapes and underperforming ecosystems. And I think we cannot even imagine what we could actually produce, both on perennial lands and annual, and especially when we start mixing the two. So thank you so much for, for opening a lot of doors and opening a lot of images that we couldn't imagine before. It's You're our welcome. Mission. It's a pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? And what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soy builders and investors in this space. The soy builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale. And the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals, 
or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations, um, institutional capital, banks, insurance companies, etc. Is this course free? No. This is pay what you think it's worth. Meaning, I have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you. And I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast, um, we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you. If this course is creating value to you, and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're going to look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soy builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.